Well, hello everyone. We are here with period six, 1900 to the present day. I was super excited to make this final video for you as you review for the AP World Test and really kind of review all these concepts of period six. And this is a big one, I'm not gonna lie. It is a lot of information and some of these things are gonna feel a little disjointed, but we're gonna throw them in here and make sure that we can review them for you. Now, the first key concept for period six is science and the environment. And there's a lot that goes into this if you ever look through the key concept guide of the things that they want you to know. And the reality is, as you look at the bottom of the screen right here, all these things down here are things that they want you to know. First of all, commercial airplanes. We have new transportation, new modes of communication and transportation that really just eliminate geographic distance. And so that's one of the major things that emerges during this period over time. And so that's kind of a pretty big deal. We also see new scientific paradigms. And so as you're thinking through, and this is going to be earlier during this period, the theory of relativity, uh, quantum mechanics, Einstein, the Big Bang Theory, um, emergence of different psychological beliefs. And so we see that's also going to come out during this time period. Uh, the Green Revolution is going to be major. And when you think of the Green Revolution, we just want you to think about how people use chemical or genetically altered agriculture so that they have more food. And so they were able to do this, and it's more resistant to other things. Now, there are some health you know, ramifications to that, um, but the goal is to create more food, and that's what the Green Revolution was. We also see uh, how medical innovations, such as like the polio vaccine, antibiotics, the artificial heart, all these types of things are able to allow people to live longer and uh, increase life expectancy. And then finally, we see that energy technologies, like the use of oil and nuclear power, is going to raise productivity and that all goes into the key concepts of 6.1. Now, as we are interacting more with the environment and as our population is expanding at a huge rate, we're gonna see that that's gonna impact the planet more and we're gonna see how that's going to be detrimental at different parts. We know that we are using uh, the Earth's fossil fuels and finite resources uh, more extensively than we ever have before. And so as we look at our first picture here and we look at oil, we know that's a big deal in the global market today. We know it's a big deal if you're from the United States as um, it's very normal for everybody to have a car and to use gas. And so uh, people are looking for more oil and becomes, as the United States at least, really dependent on other people for that oil. Uh, we also see the ideas of global warming, uh, greenhouse gases, pollutants, those things increasing, as well as just how that is impacting the world as we deforestation and cut down uh, forests for their timber, and just the idea of how we see, and this is the one thing that, I don't know if you've learned in your science classes, but just about global warming, uh, doesn't just always mean that it gets hot, it just means that seasons are more uh, extreme. So, We'll see hotter summers, we'll see colder winters. Uh, and we're from Wisconsin, if you haven't been able to tell from the accent in the video. Um, but in Wisconsin, we sometimes have really severe winters um, and really hot summers. And so those things go together, just if you haven't really learned much about global warming and how that is occurring. Now, one of the other major things that you need to understand is how, uh, with these new scientific innovations, with these other kind of... Uh, things we see, we are seeing that there's some major demographic shifts. Now, demography, if we break that word down, is a study of populations. And so as we look at these different stages, this is called the demographic transition. But if you look at this little graph here, uh, it talks about how at one point we have high birth rates and death rates. And so at this time, we have a low population and we have high birth rates, but also high death rates, and so the population remains pretty low. Once we hit industrialization and we kind of modernization as we're looking at this period, we're gonna see first, due to medical advances, the death rate is going to uh, decrease and go down significantly as we learn more about science, which is the key concept here. And then over time, we're gonna see that people adjust and they start having less kids, and so the birth rate goes down. 
But as we're looking at this, because there was a high uh, birth rate and a low death rate, we're seeing that this population here is increasing drastically until a point where they kind of intersect and now we have a low death rate and a low birth rate. And that kind of evens up um, the population. So you may have seen these population pyramids before, but we're seeing how there's been shifting in the developing world of populations. For example, if we're going to consider, uh, for example, the Congo, a developing nation, we see that people's life expectancy is still pretty low. They're not living to these older ages, but our birth rate is still pretty high. Places like the United States, on the other hand, have a pretty decent life expectancy as we're looking at females being the ones that live slightly longer here on the top. Um, but they're reaching high ages um, and they're born at a pretty steady rate. So there's a very slow growth as you see here. But places like Germany, they have negative growth as you can kind of see. This area, the birth rates are much lower than what we're seeing um, as the death rates. And so their population is going to decline. And so when you add in disease and scientific innovations and just kind of our birth and death rates, you're going to see that how this impacts the global population. And we see uh, as we look at the demographic transition that developing nations like the Congo, uh, and that all goes back to imperialism, right? As we know that um, Europeans really have stunted the growth of many African nations because of imperialism. We're going to see these issues kind of arise as people go through this transition and become industrialized. And then as we looked at that chart in the last page, uh, we'll even out their birth and death rates. Now, as we look at some of the major diseases that emerged during the 20th century, uh, the big one during this time was the 1919 influenza epidemic, uh, which happened right after World War I, or at the end of that, in kind of in the year after, as we're looking at things. And so that's a major deal. And when you look at the numbers of people that died, uh, it's humongous. And it is, to some people, like larger than the Columbian Exchange and the deaths that occurred um, from the different diseases brought to the Americas. And so this is a pretty big pandemic as we look at that. But we also see things that have emerged and we talked about Ebola. I enjoyed this picture over here because people still don't understand how big Africa is. And so when we are looking at Ebola, we are looking at this region in the most recent outbreaks that we were talking about and you've seen in the news and everywhere else did not have Ebola. So one of the things just to note, and we also see that HIV uh, is going to be something that has been uh, emerged during this time period um, in the connection uh, we've seen in different stories in the United States, but also then uh, in the developing world, especially in places in sub-Saharan Africa, as you can kind of look from the graph down here, being the major area where most people um, are affected. Um, but at the same time, when you're looking at the numbers comparable into the United States, we see 2.4 million people um, as well there. And so there's a lot of different areas of where AIDS has spread, but these are modern epidemics to be aware of. Now, another thing to be aware of is to understand the definition of feminism, as all throughout this course we've talked about social hierarchies and patriarchy, uh, and it wasn't until really this period of time, the modern era, uh, that we see that feminism, which again has many negative connotations sometimes, but really the definition is really uh, aimed at, a collection of movements aimed at establishing and defending equality, which is not that revolutionary. Um, and so we see two different waves of this. First of all, it's mostly political rights and so voting rights. And then over time, more of the economic and cultural and social rights for women. And one of the things that allowed women to be able to have maybe more control over uh, their careers, which means that they can make more money, etc., cetera, uh, really was the emergence of birth control that came out in the 60s. And so this idea allows women to have more control over fertility um, and deciding when they want to have children. So this is a big deal. And because most 50% of the population, as we look at this, uh, that's a, it's a big deal to understand what this does to affect the workplace um, and then allowing women to have equal access to that. Another major thing during this time period is the improved military technology. So when we're talking about things like the Maxim machine gun, as we're looking over here, and we understand how that was used 
uh, in World War I with trench warfare. We see that this increased technology, they kind of had old tactics with new technology, uh, caused a ton of deaths, increased deaths by so, like it was huge and significant. As you've learned about World War I, we know that uh, the deaths, like people were excited to go to war, and then the deaths and the casualties caused by that uh, were so extreme that people were really in despair and depressed and were not as excited. And why we see in World War II people tried to prevent it at such great rates. And we also see other, besides just looking at things like tanks and airplanes, but we also see the atomic bomb being huge as a major scientific development as well. So science was 6.1, and understanding how science and the environment have been impacted. Key concept 6.2, then, looks at the global conflicts and their different consequences. And as we start out period 6, you need to understand that these great empires that we talked about in the past, in period 5, even into period, really starting all the way back in period 4, we see that these older empires are collapsing. So when we look at the Ottoman Empire, we're going to see that after World War I, that the Ottoman Empire will collapse. We'll see the emergence of Turkey eventually, but we're going to see that they are done. We're going to see that Russia and our key players here would be like the Romanov dynasty, which has been around for quite some time. You probably remember talking about Peter the Great and Catherine all the way up to Nicholas. And so Nicholas is second and what that happens during this time period. And then they collapse and we'll see kind of how they reemerge as the USSR. And then we'll see that collapse as well during this period. And then another empire that will collapse, we'll look at China in East Asia. And we're going to see the Qing dynasty um, under the kind of Manchu control also collapse. We'll see them move into the age of the Republic. And then we'll see them arise as communists under Mao. And so we see some major older empires just collapse and fall off the map as we see new things emerge during this time period. Another thing that changes is the idea of um, old school col colonization and people becoming free from that. And so, so one way that people became independent was through negotiated decolonization. Deep down, I really just want this to be an essay because I think this would be a great one for you guys to write about. But one way that they became free was through this negotiation process. And so one of those countries that did this would be like the example of India and then also the creation of Pakistan. As we know that at one point, as you look at this bottom picture here, uh, India was under the control of the British. They were a colony. Um, at one point, it was more just the British East India Company. But after the Sepoy Mutiny, uh, they really took over more control and it became kind of a true colony. But then we had these different nationalist movements, people like Gandhi, working with the Indian National Conference, uh, Congress. We see that they are going to work through and negotiate and talk with the British, especially once we get after World War II, um, how democracy, it's really hypocritical to say that we're fighting against people that are ruling other areas like Hitler was, and they're doing the same thing. And so they negotiate their freedom. And we know that the big deal is whether or not they should be a unified India like Gandhi wanted or if they should have a separate state because of kind of the unevenness of the Hindu population and Muslim population. And so Muhammad Ali Jinnah wanted to create a separate state for Muslims. And so we see that that's actually what happens. 1947, there's the partition. And as you can see from this other picture down here, we'll just draw right through it. We're going to have India. We're going to have the creation. At first, it was going to be East and West Pakistan. But we have Pakistan, which is where your Indus River is. And then we have eventually the creation of Bangladesh. Bangladesh. And then we're going to see that it's going to happen quite some years later. But we're going to see that's a major deal. But they negotiated, without armed resistance, their freedom. Now, there obviously were many tensions along the way, but that's how that became of that. If we jump over to Africa, we see that the Gold Coast, which will become Ghana, is going to be the first uh, free African nation, 1957, uh, with Kwame Nkrumah negotiating, once again, uh, their freedom. In the Congo as well, this one's kind of tricky to throw in here, but the Congo, we know that King Leopold at one point uh, controlled the Congo as kind of his personal uh, 
colony, if you will. It then eventually got taken away from him, and the Belgians then had their colonial rule, and they negotiated their decolonization, and then they go through a really rough period that is not so negotiated, not so peaceful, where they go through Mobutu, who is a dictator, Kabila, who then has a coup against him, and then there's the Congo War, and then Kabila's son, Joseph Kabila, gets elected in free democratic elections. But either way, it's it's kind of messy at times, but we see that many people negotiate their um, decolonization. And so other people, and this is probably what you would think, um, have an armed struggle for decolonization. A great example of this would be Vietnam. We see that Vietnam uh, once was under the control of the French. This was once called French Indochina. And so when we say that area, we're really looking at this gray period here, um, as well as going into Thailand and Myanmar. But mostly for this one, we're going to look at the countries of Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia. And Ho Chi Minh is going to declare um, independence for Vietnam in 1945, and they are tilting towards a communist state. And so we know kind of when the context of what's going on, that's a big deal, and we're, we know this will link to some other things in a second. But the French were then going to fight back for control. We have the, Fran the franco Viet Minh War. And then we're going to see the creation and the division between North and South Vietnam. That line is not very accurate. But, you know, they have a North and South of Vietnam. And there's an armed struggle for this. And eventually uh, they are independent. And so that's kind of the way that they got their freedom. It wasn't negotiated, but it was an armed struggle, as we see from many different countries. Now, if we're going to look back into this key word that we love in AP World of causes and effects, one cause for decolonization were these nationalist movements. Now, here's a really good definition of nationalism. Nationalism, whenever you see the word or the letters ISM, it's like the practice of. And so we see this the practice of this strong patriotism or national kind of identity. And so this Whenever we say nationalism, we're saying there's this communal identification with one's nation or people group. And so another part of nationalism is this idea that there should be a political independence for a particular group of people or nation, um, which we typically call a country. And so these people at the bottom of the screen are our key nationalists during this time. If you don't know who they are, on the left-hand side, we see Jinnah and Gandhi. So we're talking about Pakistan and India. Then we have Ho Chi Minh in Vietnam. And then we see uh, Kwame Nkrumah when we're looking at Ghana. Now there's also some transnational movements that are going to be this. And when we see these words, we break again, we're looking at across nations. And so this communal identification within a people group that is beyond just a nation, okay? And so communism is going to be one of those communal identifications. As you look at the bottom left picture, we are going to see that the first world often during this time, and I think many people don't realize that this means first world were those that were those that identified with democratic ideals. The second world actually were people who were communist nations, or they had this communal identification with communist nations. And then the third world was essentially those that were not aligned or uh, developing nations is what we call them today. And so that's one way, a transnational movement. Another one would be pan-African, and saying there's this communal African uh, identity, a lot of times caused because they had similar experiences, and the same is true with pan-Arabism. And so we're looking at people from the Arabian area, um, and maybe have a similar common um, identification as a people group. And so we see that these transnational movements are another thing that we look at at period six. Now, as we go kind of along, we're going to see conflict in this time period. And a lot of these conflicts were led um, really because of this colonization and imperialism and things we've looked at before. And again, when we mix that with nationalism. And so we see that these conflicts led to a rise in ethnic violence. And there's a lot of examples here. Um, so could be great if there was ever an essay on this, but about ethnic tensions, because hopefully you would know a lot about them. The first one we really talk about is the Armenian Genocide, uh, the perpetrators being the young Turks to the Christian Armenians. 
And so as we've learned about the Ottoman Empire before and their push to become more modern, uh, we see the Christian Armenians becoming targeted as we see them not really fitting uh, with the identity of this new national group that we're going to see and eventually will become Turkey. But we also see the Holocaust, and you know probably a lot about that, but that was with a Nazi or Nazi Germany to the Germans and Polish Romanis and the LGBT community. We see the Nanjing Massacre, where we see the Ch Japanese uh, really targeting the Chinese in the Americas. While this was not a genocide by any means, but we still see some massive tensions and violence um, after uh, the bombing of Pearl Harbor and those Japanese people who were living in the United States at that time. And so we have internment camps, so a lot of ethnic tensions there. Rwanda between the Hutu and Tutsis and Israel between Israelis and Palestinians in that uh, land. And so lots of ethnic tensions that emerged during this time. Uh, we also see that because people were granted um, independence, that these political changes and how they drew the boundary lines caused, we like that word again, social issues as we kind of analyze why these things happened. And so when the creation of West and East Pakistan occurred in India and the partition of 1947, we had people then that moved all across um, to their new lands, if you will. So if people were in India and they were uh, Islamic, where they're Muslims, essentially, we see that they're going to move then to these other areas, and they didn't live there yet. And many people who are Hindu lived in Pakistan, and so now they're trying to move to India. And so we have some major tensions, major fighting that breaks out, as you just think about what it looks like to be uprooted and left from your homeland. And then we see the same thing happen in Israel, with the creation of Israel after World War II, and just this being a land where people lived already. It's not like there was no one there. And so we have these tensions between Palestinians and Israelis and the idea that we don't really have a two-state solution that like the UN had originally proposed when the creation of Israel occurred. We also, if you really were going to sum up period six, military conflicts is really the gist of a lot of it. And I know you guys wish that this would be what the essay questions are on the AP test, and it typically hasn't happened, but you never know this could be your year. You need to know the three major conflicts that were military-based in this time, World War One, obviously, two, and then also the Cold War. And I would always know, and the thing that they focus on always, is causes, effects, and then the military technologies that were used. So causes of World War I, we say mania. If you're not familiar with that, we say it's an acronym that stands for militarism was a cause, the alliance system was a cause, nationalism, as we just looked at what that meant, imperialism, and then also the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand. So if that helps you remember the cause of World War I, there you go. Now the effects of World War I were the massive casualties that occurred. We see that the Treaty of Versailles was the peace treaty that happened at the end, but again, it put a lot of fault on the Germans, which eventually, if we look at effects, led to World War II. World War II then, if we're looking at causes, we see that Hitler defies the Treaty of Versailles. We see his aggression as he wants the Sudetenland. We see that he wants Czechoslovakia. We see then that he invades Poland, which ultimately starts World War II in many people's books. And then we see that this kind of failure of the Allies or people didn't want to go to war again. They really didn't like what happened in World War I. They were trying to fight it in all ways that they could. But appeasement failed. And ultimately, we see the start of World War II in Europe. Effects of World War II, massive casualties once again. We see things like the Holocaust happen, these ethnic tensions. We also see on the good side of decolonizations and independent countries emerging. But as World War I led to World War II, World War II will lead to the Cold War. And as World War II ends and the two great superpowers that emerge are the USSR and the United States, we have some major ideological differences such as communism versus democracy and these tensions that are really big, especially when we're like, hey, USSR, you seem to have this non-aggression pact with Germany we we're fighting against. And then obviously those things switch sides again and they fought on the same side at the end of World War II. But again, some major tensions between the two. Now, some of the effects of the Cold War is besides massive propaganda 
of which ideology is better. We see proxy wars where the the war was never hot directly between the USSR and the United States, but they fought kind of through uh, these other wars, these proxy wars like the Korean War, Vietnam War, and then the Soviet War in Afghanistan. We see the nuclear arms race, we see the space race, we see new military alliances emerge like NATO and the Warsaw Pact. And then ultimately, one of the major effects of the Cold War is that the Soviet Union is dissolved and that ends the Cold War. So lots of military conflicts that we, I know you wish we would have talked about more, but that is one of the major areas. There are also some other people that oppose this major conflicts that have been happening. And one of the one thing that I don't know if you are aware of, but Picasso, uh, the artist, painted a really famous painting called Guernica. And Guernica is actually in response to the bombing of Guernica, the city, um, by Nazi Germany and fascist Italy warplanes. Um, at the request of many Spanish nationals, they were in the middle of their own civil war. And so one of the ways um, that people dealt with this is through art. And Picasso's Guernica is considered to be like the most famous, widely acclaimed um, way of using art to kind of have this powerful anti-war painting. Now, for many of you, it doesn't make a ton of sense. But when you dig into the meaning behind his art, we see that Guernica... Uh, which I saw in Madrid this past year, which is pretty awesome. It's huge. Like, you think it's just like a painting, but it's like, it's gigantic in how um, many feet long. It's like 11 feet tall, I would guess. Um, and then 20 to 30 feet long. So really big painting. We also see the anti-nuclear movement, and we see the nonviolent movement. When we think of the nonviolence movement, we always think of Gandhi, we think of Martin Luther King, and the different civil rights movements that we see occur. And so many people oppose this conflict that we see during this period of time. We see other groups that are not necessarily the countries, um, but other groups that use violence for these political reasons to get their point across. Uh, when I was growing up, I heard of the IRA a lot, the Irish Republican Army. Their goal was to remove Northern Ireland from the Great Britain. Um, in 2005, they actually ended the armed resistance part of this using violence for political reasons. Um, but Again, still within your lifetime. The PLO is the Palestinian Liberation Organization, founded in 1964. Their goal, again, using armed resistance or use of violence, as we set up here. Um, they later rejected violence, actually, and Israel officially recognizes the PLO as the, peop the representative body, essentially, of the Palestinian people. But we know there's still a lot of tensions between Israel and Pakis Palestine today, not Pakistan. And then finally, probably the one that you have heard the most about during your lifetime is the organization of Al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda stands for the base. It's a Sunni Islamic fundamentalist group uh, that was led by Osama bin Laden. We know that they were involved in the U.S. embassy bombings that occurred in Africa. We know that Osama bin Laden uh, in Al-Qaeda was behind 9-11, along with kind of the main mastermind, if you don't know this name yet, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, who is the one that planned it. Still today, Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, um, at least when this video is created, is in Guantanamo Bay. But the two of them worked together to plan 9-11. And so we see that this use of violence, in this case terrorism, um, for their political means and what they're trying to prove. And so... Uh, that's something else to kind of remember that we see emerge in this period as well. Now, on somewhat of a lighter note, I guess, but we see that global conflicts impact pop culture. This is one of those key concepts that sneaks its way in there, but uh, during the time of like 007, throughout this time, we see uh, these movies, and there's many 007s through time, as actors change, but we see uh, these conflicts in the real world get basically pulled into pop culture. You play any video games, and you can think, like, who is the quote-unquote bad guy in our video games? Uh, you will oftentimes say, like, hmm, that's weird. Like, at different times, it's like Russians. As we look at the Cold War, these global conflicts impact um, pop culture. And many times, it's like during World War II, and so we see who's on which side there. And even if you watch really modern shows, some shows I watch, NCIS Los Angeles, you'll see a lot of times they're fighting some sort of Islamic terrorist or they're looking at the Russians. Um, and the same thing is Prison Break makes an epic comeback this year. Um, we see that it takes place in Yemen and talking about ISIL. And so 
or as many people know as ISIS. And that's a modern issue. And so we see how these global conflicts impact modern day pop culture. Last but not least, 6.3. We're almost there. Uh, new concepts of the global economy, society, and culture as we become more globalized in the world. So first thing, we're going to see new concepts of the economy. Now, when we're looking at that, we're saying that in the past, you may have remembered um, Adam Smith. We talk about the Enlightenment, this idea of the invisible hand that guides and kind of self-corrects the economy. Well, in Spirit 6, something happens. 1929 Great Depression in the United States, which happens to be then a global depression impacting everyone. Many people were saying, hey, this invisible hand isn't really self-correcting. We are in dire need for something to happen. And so Jan we have another um, economist that comes around with a new theory known of Keynesian economics, named after himself, John Maynard Keynes. Uh, and it's this idea that sometimes there needs to be like a jump start to the economy um, to be able to get it to get going again, if you will. And so we see in the United States, like New Deal policies and how the government um, infuses the economy with money to help kind of jump start it. We also see in Germany a little bit different of a response. We see the fascist government control of Germany helps kind of return and getting their um, economy back in option, so in order. And so it's these new concepts of the economy. If we look at another major one, right? This is huge over here. We see that period six is the emergence of truly communist countries or command control of these economies. And so we see under, uh, well, we see, first of all, the formation of the Soviet Union. Uh, we see with Lenin, his new economic policy. We see under Stalin, he has his five-year plans. And then in China as well, as they were also communists, we see Mao Zedong and his great leap forward. So lots of new ways to think of the economy, but uh, still we see that free market capitalism is a big deal. We see later on, much later on, we see that Deng Xiaoping in China opens up China, even if they were uh, still communist, we see some free market capitalism trickle in, uh, which then led to the famous Tiananmen Square uh, protests and people saying, like, you kind of open the door towards this, we want more freedoms, and there was kind of, the regime came back, and as we saw a famous tank man situation of people kind of standing up to the government, uh, but again, they cracked the door open when they said, like, we can now have some free markets, you can have businesses, the government doesn't control all of them, and so we see this clash of these two beliefs in China, most specifically under Deng Xiaoping, after the death of Mao Zedong. We also see under Reagan and Margaret Thatcher, uh, free market capitalism, and that's the world we know today um, if you live in the United States. We also have alphabet soup. Um, there's no easy way to say this, but there's new organizations and agreements that emerge during period six. Obviously, international organizations, it starts with the League of Nations post-World War I, which we did not join as Americans, even though it was Wilson's idea with his 14 points. We see it merges and kind of becomes the United Nations after World War II, which we are a part of. Then we see new economic organizations like the World Bank, the World Trade Organization, and the International Monetary Fund. We see humanitarian organizations, UNICEF, Red Cross, Amnesty International, World Health Organization, and other nonprofits and non government organizations that do great work around the world. We see regional trade agreements. When we're looking back at the economy again, the European Union. North, North Atlantic Free Trade Agreement. And so we're looking at kind of trade between Mexico, United States, and Canada. Uh, OPEC being, uh, I always want to say oil, organizations, organization of petroleum exporting countries. And then Asian, as we look at Association of Southeast Asian Nations, having these regional trade agreements where they try to lower tariffs and make trade really possible within their regions. And then we have multinational corporations that uh, operate across borders like Shell, which is oil, Coca-Cola, Sony, and many, many more that are out there. So a little alphabet soup for you, but as we're closing up period six, we have the last few things here. We see new concepts of society and culture as we come to a close, human rights being something that we really value, and that's pretty normal for us. But again, throughout all of this course, we've looked at where no one said that all people were born free and equal. That first came around with the Enlightenment, right? And then as we look into modern day times, we are starting, at least it feels like we're starting, to really say that 
these are human rights that everyone should have. And we see that the United Nations is also upholding these. Um, and that's why when we look at things like in South Africa, with apartheid that emerged in the mid-20th century and continued all the way into the 90s, really early 90s, um, we see that other corporations, like people are boycotting Shell, which is a multinational corporation. We see that people are um, going about and saying things about how they should free Nelson Mandela from Robben Island. And so people get together around the world and they say, hey, we need to stand up for these basic human rights. Um, and they have kind of this charter that explains what those are, as you can see from the picture here. And finally, globalization. Last slide. We are almost there. Globalization is the breaking down of traditional boundaries in the face of an increasing global financial and cultural trends. Basically, if you were to sum it up, that we are increasing connection. And so we are seeing that the world's traditional borders of where one country starts and ends and another country begins, that these traditional boundaries are becoming kind of shattered as the world is more and more connected. We see that pop culture kind of spreads everywhere. We see that this English language or Pan-American culture goes a lot of places, which we have some negative and positive effects of these things as people push back on these. Um, there's links to terrorism to that. We see there are negative parts of how it impacts the environment. Um, but we see also on the really bright sides that there's no way you can go um, with the genocide that happens without the news carrying it today. And there are people that get involved and non-government organizations and non-profits uh, give money to help out in times of need. And so as the world uh, becomes more and more connected, uh, we have good things and bad things that happen from this. But ultimately, we have made it through the course. You have made it through Period 6 video. I wish you the best um, on the AP exam, if that's why you're watching this. Um, but good luck, and you have covered world history. Keep being a great learner um, as we make history every day.